So today we are going to finish the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm excited about that. Um, this is the third book of the Bible that we've started at the beginning and walked all the way through, just kind of verse by verse as we've done. Uh, we started in the book of Philippians, and then we went to the Gospel of Matthew, and now we've finished, uh, after today we'll have finished the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes did not take us a shade under a decade like the other two books did. I thought it would be about a 32-week 30, series. Uh, we've wound up right around 50. I'd have to go back and, and count exactly what it was, but just under eight months that we'll have spent in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so it's been a really good study. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been good for me. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. So uh, if you are uh, just visiting with us or if you're new today, uh, we're going to get you caught up so that you're not, uh, you don't feel like, man, I just came in right at the end. Uh, it's, it's okay. We'll get you all caught up. So Solomon was king over Israel, and uh, Solomon's goal, his purpose, was to prove that any pursuit that is outside of or in place of the pursuit of God would leave you feeling worthless and meaningless, and at the end of your life, feeling like you had dedicated your life to the wrong things, and therefore he wanted to rule it meaningless, worthless. This, this pursuit is worthless. It's meaningless. And so that's what he was trying to do. And he set out, he, he kind of developed the scientific method. We can see the, the steps of the scientific method throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes. So he did it systematically. And the Bible tells us that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived and the wisest man who would ever live. And the Bible tells us that even through these pursuits, his wisdom never left him. So he was applying his wisdom to these different pursuits. And because of his wealth, because of his fame, because of the fact that he was king, any of these pursuits that he did, he did them full on, bigger and badder than any of us could ever do them. And what we see at the end of the book is that he proved his hypothesis that every pursuit outside of or in place of the pursuit of God was worthless, was meaningless. He pursued work. He pursued women. He pursued wine. Those are the three W's. He also pursued giving back and charity. He, he, he was the, the first king in history, of recorded history, that actually did things for the people, like public parks and places for them to go. Uh, he, he was a, an engineer. He designed some things, some of the things that, that he in, uh, installed in the temple that he built, which, by the way, that temple lasted for years and years and years. Uh, some of those things were the first times ever in recorded history that we have that they were used, and so he was inventing things to use, and then there were some things that he did, like a, a water system to get more water into the city that were still being used when the Romans conquered them, that were still being used when Jesus was walking around ministering in the city. So we're talking a thousand years later uh, that, that this was taking place, and these were all things that he designed, that he built, that he did, so he, he dedicated himself to all these different pursuits, and when he did, they left him feeling the same way that he said that they would leave us feeling. Now, here's why this is significant. The pursuits that Solomon dedicated himself toward are the same pursuits that we see people chasing after today. So instead of pursuing God, instead of having as your sole purpose to know God, to discover God, to experience his presence, to, to, to allow him to be the one that directs your steps as he is creator, he gives purpose. Instead of that, people are choosing to pursue other things, and we see that in the world. We also see that in the church. And so this is important for us to have this understanding that, what, that our purpose should be derived from our pursuit of God. 
And then as we pursue God, the more we know him, the more we understand what he wants us to do, who he wants us to be. And the more we do that, the more it draws us closer to him. One of the examples that we have in the life of Solomon is that as he dedicated his life to pursue these other things, they drew him away from God. And that's the exact same thing that happens right now. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, teachings, a lot of books, a lot of podcasts, a lot of things out there that are even written by Christian authors, by pastors, and they're, they're not about how to find God or how to apply your knowledge of God to life or, or how, to, how to allow God to direct your steps. They're all about you can do this and you can achieve greatness and you can do this and, and three steps to finding you, whatever you want to find, and they're all about you doing you. And this is opposite of the book of Ecclesiastes and the wisdom of Solomon. He says the best thing that you can do is to dedicate your life to the pursuit of God. And the more you know God, the, it draws you close to him instead of drawing you further away from him. And the closer you draw to him, the more you understand the reason that he made you, the purpose that he's giving you, the things that he wants you to do as you walk throughout your everyday life. So if you're wandering around life, wondering what is my purpose, what is it that I should do, the answer that Solomon would give would be pursue God. Know God more, find God more, gain a deeper understanding of who he is, and as you see him, you will find yourself. Then as he's, after he's presented all of that information, then he, he sets his mind in this book that he's writing, to not just present the information, but also to, to help us be able to apply the information. So he begins telling us some things that might deter us or prevent us altogether from the pursuit of God. He talks about how just being foolish can prevent us or deter us. He, he talks about how fear can prevent us or deter us altogether from pursuing God. He talks about anxiety and how anxiety can prevent us or deter us from pursuing God. And, and he doesn't stop there. He reminds us that we are not our own, that we have a creator and that our lives should be directed by our creator. And he does this to help us combat any feelings that we might have, that we should get what we want, that, we should, should, that God should be pursuing us instead of us pursuing God. He encourages us not to put off our pursuit of God, but to go all in, to do it now, and to never stop. And he reminds us that the only way to avoid the trap of having lived a meaningless life is to devote yourself to something that is bigger than you, to the pursuit of God, committing yourself to do what he puts in front of you to do because God gives significance to our actions both on earth and in eternity. Solomon ends his book with this short autobiographical section uh, and he takes one more opportunity to do what every book in the Old Testament does. And then he states his conclusion or the summation of all of his research. So I think we can, we can find these three sections in this last little bit of Scripture. But I want us to read together chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. And this is what it says, and this is still being written by Solomon, so he slides into third person right now. So you can picture him like after the biggest game of his life, he's at the podium, they're interviewing him, and he's the superstar in the room. And he kind of, for just a couple verses, kind of starts talking about himself in third person. He says, not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched for, to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collective sayings, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now, all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Again, 
I think we can break this passage of Scripture into three categories. I think each category teaches us some things that we need to know about our pursuit of God. And so here is the first category. The first category is the example. The example. This is the part of the passage where Solomon breaks himself into third person. He starts talking about himself as the author. This is autobiographical. Uh, He was very open with what he saw and what he experienced throughout the book. I think his goal uh, throughout this entire writing has been to offer us as readers a pattern to follow as we learn from his mistakes what not to do. And the knowledge that he gained through applying his wisdom to those mistakes, what to do. So Solomon gives us this example, and then he draws our attention towards it as he ends the book by saying, listen, I'm going to talk to you about me for a little bit. I've written this as an example for you to follow. I've been very open about my mistakes. I've been very open about the things that I've seen that have happened. I've been very open about what I've learned from these. And so you can learn from the example what not to do, and you can learn from the example what to do. And the entire book is a record and example of this, but I think in this he points out three things. Again, let's read verses 9 and 10. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. So here's the first part that he draws our attention to in this passage. He was wise. He was wise. Not only was the teacher wise. Now the wisdom of Solomon, that's what he's known for. That's his calling card, right? And so he's saying, listen, you can chalk all of this up to, well, sure, says the wisest man ever to live, and then dismiss it. And he's saying, no, 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 don't do that. There's some examples to follow. Not only is he wise, but he did some other things as well. But we can't discount the fact that he's acknowledging his wisdom. He was wise. In our pursuit of God, the more we know about God, the more wisdom we will be able to apply to our everyday life. Because God will speak to us. God will speak through us. He will give us, he will impart the wisdom to us. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, we read the story of Solomon asking God for wisdom. God appears to him in a dream. Solomon is a young king. He's just been named king. In fact, he wasn't even the first choice for king. He's already had two older brothers try to make themselves king. And then before a third one could do that, David, still living, makes Solomon sort of this co-regent. So everyone knows that David is the king until David dies, but until that happens, Solomon is also king. And so there's this weird limbo about a two-year period where Solomon was king and David was king, and he did that so that everyone would know this is the king. In this process, the Lord appears to Solomon and says, listen, what is it that you want? Ask me for anything, I will give it to you. How can I help you be the king of Israel? And Solomon, from a young age, says, listen, I'm just a kid. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead these people. I don't know what's expected of me. So if you would just give me wisdom to help me be a good king, give me wisdom to help me know what I should do, I mean, that's what I'm going to ask. And God says, wow, that's amazing. You know, you could have asked for power. You could have asked for glory. You could have asked for riches. You could have asked for the death of your enemies. But you didn't. You asked for wisdom to lead well. And so I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to make you the wisest person ever. And because you did this, it pleases me. I'm also going to make you famous. I'm also going to give you wealth. I'm also going to give you the death of your enemies. I'm also going to give you everything else that you didn't ask for. And this is where we read this story in 1 Kings 3. Now, it's easy for us to write this off as as a one-time thing. Like, oh, yeah, well, sure, God gave him wisdom, and we see that in the Bible. Just like if we're talking about Samson, it'd be easy to to write that off as a one-time thing. Oh, sure, God made Samson strong. He gave him strength. But that'll never happen again. And we can take this approach with some. Oh, yeah, yeah, God made Solomon wise. That'll never happen again. No, the whole point of this, the whole story of this, is that God gives wisdom. That it's his to give. And the New Testament tells us that if you lack wisdom, you can ask, and that he gives it freely. 
Now, he may not make you the wisest person ever to live because that's already been done. That was the one-time thing. But it doesn't mean that he withholds wisdom. He gives wisdom, and he gives wisdom freely. And the example that Solomon is pointing us to in the end of this book is the teacher was wise. You can be wise. As you pursue God, he will give you wisdom. The same Solomon wrote Proverbs 4, chapter 5. And it, it, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 5. In fact, what he's doing in this passage of Scripture is he's reciting some things that his dad, King David, had taught him. And this is what he says, get wisdom, get understanding. If this was beyond us, if this was something that was just a one-time thing that happened in Scripture that ne can never happen again, if God giving wisdom wasn't something that God did, the wisest man ever wouldn't encourage us to get it. But he does, because he knows that this is just an example of how God gives wisdom if we pursue him. And he's telling us he was wise. Here's the second example. He shared what he knew. Verse 9 says, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He shared what he New. In the Hebrew language, the word that we translate as imparted has the connotation of a cycle of always learning so that he can always teach. So when we think of in English of he imparted knowledge, we think of he gave it away. So if you, if you picture in your mind a pitcher, the pitcher is full. Imparting would be dumping the pitcher out. And that's how it is in English. But in the Hebrew, this particular word is not dumping out. Imparted is there's a constant income and a constant outgo. And that the outgo is because of the income. That what was happening was Solomon, in his wisdom, dedicated himself to learning things because he had dedicated himself to teaching things. And if he, if he wanted to have anything to teach, he had to have something to know. Has, has anyone that has kids, has, has any of your kids ever asked you something, and in all honesty, you had no clue? <laughs> Today, she said. <laughs> so that, I mean, yeah, this can happen to us, right? It's, I mean, they, they ask us, and we're like, man, that is a good question. Let's see what Mr. Google has to say about that. And so we've experienced this, right, where we have to learn something so that we can teach something. And Solomon wasn't waiting for that moment to happen. He was constantly absorbing knowledge, constantly growing in knowledge because he wanted to constantly be teaching people. He didn't just, he didn't just learn and keep it to himself. His whole goal in learning was to impart knowledge to the people. In Christian circles, we call this discipleship. There's a, a, a popular model for this in Christianity. Uh, it's called the Barnabas, Saul, Timothy model. You can substitute Saul for Paul because they're the same person. Uh, let's, let's read about that. In Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 25, it says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. So you have Barnabas. He's this figure in the New Testament. Uh, he's, he's known as a, a man of, of peace. And so uh, he goes to Tarsus, especially on a mission. He was doing something there. He didn't just travel. He wasn't sightseeing. He went to look for Saul. Verse 26 says, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of of people. Now, in the Hebrew tradition, the one that's listed before is the one of greater significance. So Barnabas goes and gets Saul, and he brings him with him on the job training. They're in Antioch. They're teaching large numbers of people. This is where Paul first learned how to plant a church. This is where he first learned how to preach, how to teach, how to study, how to apply the Word of God to living people and to, to the circumstances of their daily lives. He learned all of this in this year from helping Barnabas. It says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So this was a significant moment, not just in the birth of the church, but a significant moment in the life of Saul, who, uh, whose name would be changed to Paul. Now Paul would write two-thirds of the New Testament. 
he would become the greatest missionary the world had ever seen. He was the greatest evangel. He is the the New Testament example of what it looks like to truly do whatever God asks you to do. And nothing would stop him from accomplishing the purpose that God gave him, which was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. We read in several scriptures, he was shipwrecked. We, we, in one scripture, he says that he was out to sea for three days. So the, the, the ship falls apart, and he's adrift in the ocean for three days before being rescued. We read that he was bitten by a poisonous snake and just shook it off like it was no big deal. That he was beaten, that he was left for dead, and that phrase in the Greek literally means left dead. That he was dead, that he was killed. And that God said, I'm sorry, son, you don't get to be dead right now. I got things for you to do, and raised him up, and he just walked on his merry way. And none of that would have happened if Barnabas didn't go to him and say, listen, come on. You got some things you need to know, and I got things I need to teach you. And then just five chapters later, we read in Acts chapter 16. I'm sorry, my son sat on my headset this morning, and it is all kinds of Jill flirted. It's all cattywampus. Those are two Oklahoma terms. Yeah, everybody's with me. Just five chapters after Barnabas goes and finds Saul, who becomes Paul, and takes him with him. This is what we read. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along. On the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they traveled from town to town. They delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So what we see is that, that what happened to Paul was the same model that Paul followed. So Barnabas goes and gets Paul, trains him in the ministry, on the job training, come with me, help me do what we do. And then just five chapters later, we've got Paul doing the same thing. He meets Timothy. Timothy was a young man, and he says that he wanted to take him along, and he did. And so he takes Timothy, and they go, they plant more churches, they encourage more believers. And then what ends up happening in this is that Paul installs Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And so because of this model, because Barnabas went and got Paul, Paul wrote two-thirds in the New Testament, because Paul went and got Timothy, we have the letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy, the book of Ephesians, and John even writes to the church of Ephesians in the book of Revelation. So, so four of the books in the Bible are related to this event where Paul takes Timothy with him. Now, you never know what someone else is going to do. You never know if you teach someone something, if you show them something, if you disciple them in the ways of the Lord, you never know what's going to happen because of them. But you know that God will and can do something through them. And this was the model that Solomon was proposing. He was saying, listen, I was always learning so I could always be teaching the things that we know they can't die with us. There has to be someone that we're raising up, someone that we're feeding into, someone that we're discipling. And discipleship isn't just, okay, well, let's look at the book of Acts. Discipleship is, let me tell you something that I figured out that works real well. Discipleship can just be, you know, there's a tool for that, right? Discipleship can just be, this is how we use our daily skills in a way that honors God. It doesn't have to be teaching someone, well, in the Greek, this is what it says. It's just showing someone what you know and helping them gain the knowledge that you have gained so that they can become better in their pursuit of what God has put in front of them. Here's the 
the third example. I still have other points. I've got to get through this. Here's the third example that Solomon points out when he's talking about himself as an example. He watched his mouth. Yeah. Especially during the holidays. It says he searched for just the right words. Solomon knew that words matter. He knew that what we say matters, and not just what we say, how we say what we say, which is why he searched for just the right words. He could have just said, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I'm wiser than you because God made it that way. Chapter 2, don't be dumb. (laughs) Chapter 3, I saw that, now y'all stop it. (laughs) Chapter 4, you should be wiser than that by now. Now come on, y'all. And seriously, if you wrote it that way, we would all be like, I know, Solomon, I'm sorry. But that's not how he did it. The Bible says he searched for just the right words because he knew that he had to explain things to us in a way that we would understand. He knew that he had to explain things to us in a way that would transcend time. So that all people from any background, from any era, could read these words and and apply them to their life. So he searched for just the right words. The second category that we see is the foreshadow. This is in verses 11 and 12. And this is what every book in the Old Testament does. It says, the words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now, in Psalm's day, animals were used to pull carts or wagons or plows or any number of different things. They were used to do this. Now, when, when the first time you put an animal uh, in the harness and attach something to it, if it wasn't used to that, it didn't like it. And so what it would do just by nature is it would start to kick the thing that was pulling on it because it didn't want anything pulling on it. It wanted it to be able to go do its own thing. And so how they would do this is they would take an experienced animal and they would put it with an inexperienced animal to kind of train it what to do. And they would harness it up. They would get it all tied up to whatever rigging it was going to be uh, used to pull whatever it was going to pull. And then they had a goad. Now a goad was like a broomstick, uh, but the end of it had been sharpened into a point. And they did that so they didn't have to get in the way of the kicking animal. And so they had this really long rod with a sharp point, and they would get behind, they would get in the plow or on the the cart or wherever it was, and as the animal started kicking, they would hold that goad down there so that when it kicked, it kicked the goad instead of kicking the cart. Now because it's a sharp point, if they kick the goad, it would hurt. And the animals, being smart like God made them, learned really quickly, that hurts. I shouldn't kick like that. And so they would stop kicking because they were kicking the goad, and the goad hurt them. And so what they would do is they would realize real quick, oh, this guy over here, I mean, he's just pulling this thing. I could do that. And they would just do what they were designed to do. And that's how it would work. And this is what he says. He says, the words of the wise are like goads. Sometimes we know the right thing to do. Sometimes we know what we should do, but we don't want to do that. We kick against that. Like God designed us on purpose, for purpose, and we know what that purpose is, but sometimes we don't want to mess with that, and so we kick against that. And, and Solomon's trying to teach us, that hurts you. The, the, the wisdom is like a goad. Don't kick against the wisdom. If something's wise, do the wise thing. He says the words of the wise are like a goad. Then he says they're collected sayings. Um, collected sayings, it means more than just we, we compiled them together in the Hebrew. It's not just collecting the sayings. It's a mastery of the, the collected sayings. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. Now, it's easy for us to read about nails and think of like a bed of nails or something that is painful, especially when it follows an example of a goad. 
Because a goad is a sharp thing that pokes us, that hurts. But this is not what he's talking about. He's going in the opposite end of the, of the spectrum here. A firmly embedded nail is something that secures, that holds fast. It's designed to, to hold two things together. And what he's saying is when you've mastered the collective wisdom that is out there, when you've mastered that, it holds you fast to what you're supposed to be hold, held fast to. It's like you've got nails that, that hold you in to do what you're supposed to. They're the support structure to keep you from falling away. If something is nailed in and stays nailed in, it doesn't fall away. It's when the nails come out that it falls away. And what he's saying is if you can just master the sayings of the wise, apply wisdom to your life, it will hold you together and not let you fall away. But the main point of these two verses is that word shepherd. He says, the words of the wise are like goads, mastering their collected sayings are like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. In this translation that's on our screen, um, the word shepherd is not capitalized. In most translations, it is. And that's because this is the foreshadowing of Solomon to point us toward Jesus. The entire Old Testament points toward Jesus. And this is Solomon saying, listen, the words that are wise, they're not just my words. God is speaking to you in this moment. And the wisdom that God is trying to get you to understand, it's all pointing you towards Jesus. And this will be what holds you to him. Operating in the wisdom that he gives you will be what holds you to him. In John chapter 10, Jesus himself says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. This was a very biblically literate people to whom Jesus was speaking. And so when he got up there and he said, I am the good shepherd, they would have automatically thought of what Solomon was talking about when he said, hey, listen, there's going to be some nails, the wisdom of, of, if you master the wisdom of everyone that's come before you, there's going to be some nails that hold you to the shepherd. They would have automatically connected all of those pieces, and they, they would have been, now wait a minute, you're claiming to be God because that's capitalized. That's talking about God. And this is Jesus saying, hey, I'm God, and if you belong to me, you know my voice, and I know yours. There's some, some words that you're going to hear, words you're going to know. In fact, if we, if we read, if we back up in, if we back up in John to chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word. Notice how Word is capitalized. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The words of Jesus are what hold us together. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collective sayings, like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. These words are given by one shepherd. The nails that hold us in are given by one shepherd. Jesus is saying, listen, this, this word, the words you're going to hear, they're going to draw you in. Why? Because he is the word. He is the word that draws us in. He is the word that holds us to himself. He is the one who gives us wisdom. He is the one who speaks life. He is the one who speaks the, the direction to us. The Bible says that when we're attuned to him, that he will be as one standing behind, saying, this is the way, walk in it. He is that word that gives us the direction, and he does that through wisdom. Here's the third category that we see in this passage of Scripture. It's the conclusion. We've seen the example. We've seen the foreshadowing. And now we see the conclusion. 
This is the part where he sums up all of his research with the ultimate, now what? He's trying to answer the question for us, what do we do with all of the information that he's given us? In chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, he says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, whether it is good or evil. At first reading, this can uh, kind of come off as a threat. Keep his commands or else. Because God is judging you. Always judging you. But it's not a threat as much as just something we should know. Jesus says it a different way and it's much less threatening. And so I'm going to transition us to the way that Jesus says it so we can see how it really looks. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. So he's saying the same thing. I mean, Solomon says, here's the conclusion of the matter. Obey his commands. And remember that he'll bring into an account everything you do, even if it's bad. Jesus says it this way. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The way that he ends this is, is by giving us peace and telling us, you don't have to be afraid. There's just two simple options. Either you love me and obey, or you don't love me and don't obey. And if you wonder where you fall on that, he would say it's simple. If you obey, you love me. If you don't obey, you don't love me. So he's just trying to make it as easy as it can be. And he's saying, listen, if you love me, then you're going to obey my teachings. And when you do that, I will come and my Father will come and we will make our home with you. And you will know us and we will be known by you. But if you don't, then you won't know us. He's he's saying everything that, that Solomon said just in a nicer way. Solomon's saying, obey his commands and remember that he's going to bring into an account everything. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you love me, you don't have to be afraid. If you'll just love me, you'll do what I say because you love me. And you can live in peace and you don't have to worry and you don't have to be afraid and and you you won't have, have to experience that because you are operating out of your love. And that's ultimately exactly what Solomon wants us to do. What the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about is not pursue God because you have to. Pursue God because you're afraid of what happens if you don't. Pursue God because you just don't want to be the fool. The whole book is about pursue God because you love him and because you know that he loves you. And the more you fall in love with him and experience his love for you, the more wisdom you get, the more perspective you have, the less fear you have, the less anxiety Anxiety will impact you the more strength and boldness you have to just do what he's put in front of you to do because you understand that your purpose has been given you by your creator. And out of love, you want to accomplish the things that he's asked you to do. Out of love, you want to obey his commandments. And it's all out of love. And this is the wisdom of Solomon. And this is the calling of our Savior. Will you stand with me? I'm going to close the service in prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. Jesus, we thank you for your love for us that is evident, that is overwhelming. God, that we can feel, that we can sense, that we know to be true. God, thank you for that love. 
And God, I pray that we would always be aware of the love that you have, that nothing can separate us from that love, that your love is a free gift to us. And God, because of that love, may we always be responsive to that love. And because of our love for you, let us obey and help us to obey. God, when you give us purpose, when you give us meaning, when you give us the things to do that you want us to do, the direction that you want us to take, God, I pray that we would know that, that we would lovingly, humbly obey, that we would submit to that, and God, that we would see you at work both in us and through us because of our love for you and your love for us. God, I pray that your love would be known by every person that hears this. And that your love would stir us to pursue you. And God, we thank you for the wisdom of your word that you give us. For how it can be nails that hold us to you so that we don't fall away. How simultaneously it can be goads that that prick us to do the right thing and to not fight against it. God, thank you for providing this protection for us. And God, we commit to pursue you, to know you, to find you, to see you at work. And we ask that you would be glorified as we do. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.